Uh, well, next be books, but I'm still reading the same Battletech book I was reading the last time. I just haven't made very much progress in it. Not the book's fault, I just have, you know, started working more hours, so I just haven't been reading as much. Oh, are you reading anything at the moment? Uh, I mean, I'm still, like, I still, I've been, I have a lot of books I have to read, and I've started, but I haven't finished. Well, I know the feeling. I have, I want to say, four books I'm in the middle of reading. I say in the middle, it's figure of speech. Like, I'm most of the way through this book about uh, how a lot of companies have very monopolistic practices and the government should really break them apart. Uh, how I've gotten to the point where the author has been like, by the way, the answer to all this is socialism, and I'm just like, hmm, don't think so. So, like, for intellectual honesty, I'm going to have to finish the book, but, like, it has definitely taken a turn for the worse. And then there's the Battletech book. Still reading War and Peace. I'm 10% of the way into the story, I think. Um, but I haven't picked that one up in a while. And then I'm also reading a book about the Hanseatic League. I'm not very far into that one. Oh, and I'm also reading a book about Gary Gygax and D&D &D and all that. So I guess it's five books. So, yeah. I mean... I will finish four of those probably before I read another page of War and Peace, but, you know, it is what it is. I'm in... I'm still in the middle of, like... I still, I'm, like, in the middle of the first book of the Thrawn trilogy... The uh, the older Thrawn trilogy, like like from the nineties. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, if we're talking about books, I could say I've actually started planning out the book I want to write. Oh well, there you go. How's that coming along? I wrote down like two sentences. Well, that's two more than most people ever get, Owen. So the key is to just keep keep going. So there's a there's a movie you should watch. By the way, it's it's a good movie overall, but like but there's a couple like writing things about the movie that you should. It's uh it's called uh, Wonder Boys. No, it has nothing to do with superheroes. Although half the people in it are in the MCU, uh, Iron Man, older Ant Man, and Spider Man 1.0 are all in it. So yeah. Um, so the, the main character is Michael Douglas's character, and he's a, he's a professor at a university, you know, teaches English, you know, literature, and all that, you know, writing. Toby McGuire is a student in one of his classes, uh, probably his best student. Uh, oh, Rachel Dawes, Dawes, yeah, from the, the Batman trilogy, the first version of her, not the second one that got blown up. She's in it. Uh, she's his TA and, uh, and lives with him. And surprisingly, there's nothing going on there. But, you know, because, you know, you would think, like, older guy, 20-year-old girl, like, there'd at least be, like, suspicions, but there's, there's nothing there. Uh, and then Robert Downey Jr. is his agent, because he wrote a book, uh, Michael Douglas's character. And he's been working on the sequel ever since. And, like, you see him, like, writing, and he comes, like, the page number... And it's like 200-something, and then he adds the fourth digit to the page number. And you just see this pile of paperwork everywhere. And, uh, yeah, so his agent, like, keeps wanting to know, like, hey, when are we going to see this book, you know? And so he's, he's got a few lines about writing throughout the movie that are pretty good. But the one that matters here is at the end of the movie. He is telling, because uh, some events have transpired where Tobey Maguire is possibly going to get into some trouble because he shot the Chancellor's dog in his house while the two of them were taking a look at uh, Marilyn Monroe's jacket that the Chancellor owned that the kid ends up stealing. So, like, the Chancellor's a little upset, but as Michael Douglas puts it, like, no, no, he doesn't want to expel him. Like, he's trying to figure out how he can how he can come up with a rational way to not expel him right now, trust me. And uh, he's like, you know, he's telling him, you know, what he would tell the students, you know, he's like, you tell the students that are good at writing to keep writing 
because they've got it. You know, they just need to keep writing because it'll improve. And he's like, the ones that don't have it, you tell them to keep writing too. Maybe they'll pick it up along the way, you know, but they're never going to improve if they don't. And uh, that's when Robert Downey Jr. is just kind of like, well, Professor, I'm glad America's youth's in your hands. You know, he's like, that's the hell kind of advice is that? You know, but it's that's the sound advice is just keep writing, keep doing. So, because, uh, like, Brad and I had been working on a book years ago, and we've got maybe in print probably about 40 pages worth of material written up, so you know, I've got to look into that, see if, I can ever, see if I can pull that together and actually do something with that, and uh, I've got a couple other things that I, that I started writing, and I've got ideas, but like, my prose is terrible, so... No, I got ideas too, and at least like half half of them I've already implemented in the D and D campaign I was running for school. Yeah. Well, I mean, some of the like, oh, excuse me, some of those, you know, you get your notes and everything together, you could probably still like actually hammer out a story for them. Yeah, you know? and um. I know that this isn't the prevalent way people publish today, but if you look at older sci-fi and horror authors, like up through the 70s, probably even the 80s, they published all kinds of short stories. You know, everyone's like, oh, I've got to write a novel. Like, these guys wrote all kinds of short stories. You know, like H.P. Lovecraft. Like, very well known nowadays. Um... Very well known for one or two things that he probably wouldn't like to be known for. Or maybe he would. I don't know. But uh, uh, I'll explain that in a second. But almost all of his work is short stories. Okay? Like the, these these tales people talk about. Like, I think his longest story is at the Mountains of Madness. And I think it's like 120 pages. If that. So I think it was published like piecemeal in a magazine or something. Well, I... I think I have the opposite problem. Oh, you might have the problem of uh, Michael Douglas's character in the movie. Too much. Yeah, yeah. So not to spoil the movie here, but like at one point he loses most of the paperwork, and his agent's like, "Well, I mean, you can recreate it, right?" And he's like, "He's like, I have an alternate draft of the first chapter." And so there's another guy driving a car. He's like, "Well, what was the book about?" And he's just like. I don't even know. <laughs> and Robert Edger is like, what he means is sometimes it's hard to put into words. Like, no, I, I just, I don't know. I just couldn't stop writing. That was, uh, I believe Tolstoy had that compulsion, if I remember right. Which is why War and Peace was so long. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, there's something like 500 characters in that book. Like, like I said, I'm like 120 pages into it. We've met all kinds of people. I know most of them aren't going to be anywhere else in the entire rest of the book. Like, I found the main character, I think. And so, you just got to watch him leave Moscow and go fight in the Napoleonic Wars now. Who's your favorite character in War and Peace? I can't even think of the dude's name, the main guy, off the top of my head. But, like, I know the chain of events that have happened so far. I've got that up here. But, like, my copy of the book is literally like this thing. Like it's like like a like an encyclopedia or something. But uh no, like like I said, just gotta keep going. Like I I think I'm getting better as I write more. Like I said, my prose is terrible. I've honestly thought about because I've read some of my nephew Levi's stuff. I've thought about being like, Levi, here's what I have. Make this sound better. You know, and, like, rewrite this like, you know, an author actually would. Not just someone that's like, and then, and then this happened, and this happened. Like, I'm better than that, but I'm not a whole lot better than that is the problem, you know. And one story, I've rewritten it, like, three times because I can't decide if it should be first person or third person. And, like, I see on YouTube some people are like, don't choose. Just make it both. And I'm just like, not yet. <laughs> like, that's probably the best way to do it, but, like, Every bit of writing advice I've ever heard is like, no, pick one or the other, you know. And again, we're back to the whole predictability thing. Like, 
That's uh, that's also a thing I keep reading about sometimes. Is like, you can tell there are people that think they can break the rules of things, and all they really end up showing is they don't understand why those rules existed. And then there are people that break the rules, but it's to demonstrate that they do understand why they're there, and they know when and how to break them because they're a master of whatever it is. Like. Uh, Stanley Kubrick. Uh, you know he is, right? Before I continue. Movie director. Uh, direct, directed uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Shining, Full Metal Jacket, uh, Eyes Wide Shut, and he was directing the movie AI when he passed away, and then Steven Spielberg finished it, mm-hmm. and uh, which leads to a kind of bizarre movie where, like, you've got all the the cutesy things like the Spielberg, but like the creepy horror of Kubrick, and it's just like this nightmarish mishmash. It kind of works, but anyway, uh, if you ever watch The Shining, he intentionally violates all kinds of filming principles with, like, photography and how you show characters interacting and everything. And he does it because he knows that the reason the rules exist is because that's how people are used to seeing things. And by breaking that, you subconsciously create this unsettling horrors building throughout the entire movie because things just don't look right. They literally don't look right. And so, but he understood that. And so he understood how to play with that. Someone like a Rianne Johnson would just be like, oh, don't look right. And he's like, turn the camera 90 degrees or something. Like, oh, it doesn't look right. People are unsettled. It's like, no, that's just stupid. You know, <laughs> like, you, you don't you don't get what I'm saying, you know, because you don't understand. But, uh, yeah, so he's he's well known for that. I don't know where I was going with any of that, but just throw that out there, everyone. You're like, oh, it's a literary rule I don't like. I should break this. Like, put some thought into it before you do is all I'm saying. As someone who's never been published. So, <laughs> sorry. All right. Anything else in her books? You think? Not really. All right. Thank you for watching. This has been a Geek Ball video, Echoes of a Whisper. This has been a clip from one of our podcasts. Uh, the link to the actual podcast this is from is in the description of the video if you want to see the entire thing, which we obviously encourage you to do. But otherwise, if you enjoyed what you saw, you know, a thumbs up is always appreciated. Subscriptions and all the rest is definitely appreciated. Uh, Comments, as always. But uh, just in general, thank you for watching. Hope you liked it. And uh, check out the other videos we have here on the channel. See you later.